Welcome to NWAETC Project ECHO, and I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Ramers to introduce our guest. Yeah, sure. Great. Thanks, Kent. Uh, our speaker today is Bob Harrington. I think you've heard from him before, mm -hmm. uh, medical director of the Madison Clinic, and he's going to give us an update on opportunistic infections, and there should be some real important fundamentals here, and then also a couple of uh, slides on cutting-edge stuff. So I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Great. Thank you, Christian. So yes, we're going to divide uh, opportunistic infections into two talks. I'm going to give the first one uh, today on uh, general principles and epidemiology, something on uh, pro uh, prevention and prophylaxis, and then we'll briefly go over a pneumocystis gervecii infection. Next week, uh, Sharisha Danaretti will come in and talk about iris and the uh, initiation of, of heart and the setting of acute opportunistic infections, and then she'll cover uh, a few pathogens uh, that are, well, one common, one not so common. So, so this is just to uh, remind us all that OIs kind of ushered in the uh, HIV AIDS era in the early uh, 1980s. There were reports in the MMWR first of uh, a atypical pneumonia that ended up being PCP among uh, five gay men in Los Angeles. And shortly after that, uh, 25 or so uh, gay men in New York and California were reported to have an aggressive and metastatic form of Kaposi sarcoma. Uh, and it wasn't until 1983, so two years later, that uh, uh, the AIDS virus was discovered and its connection to immunodeficiency and, uh, and how that is responsible for these opportunistic infections. So uh, the Bible for, for treating, uh, for guidelines for prevention and treatment of OIs is this publication, which uh, is available online at the aidsinfo.nih.gov website. It is updated at regular intervals. I think a new iteration is coming out soon. Uh, this one was uh, last updated in 2009. It's, uh, not, it doesn't turn over as rapidly as the HIV uh, ARV treatment guidelines, uh, but um, uh, it will be coming out with a new, a new version, I think, within the next year. So when thinking about uh, and uh, organizing uh, opportunistic infections by CD4 count, uh, I think it's important to remember that people have an AIDS diagnosis when their T cells hit uh, 200. But when stratifying uh, risk for particular infections, it's important to remember that those uh, organisms that are more virulent uh, are likely to occur at higher CD4 counts. So individuals are at risk for uh, pathogens like TB at any CD4 count that can infect HIV uninfected and infected individuals. And uh, similarly, uh, bacterial pneumonia caused by strep pneumoniae or other pathogens, a variety of uh, uh, herpes infections, diarrheal syndromes, that can occur in anyone and develop in HIV infected patients at high CD4 counts. Oral candida and aggressive forms of molluscum really don't develop until T cells are in the 2 to 300 range. And it's, and it's not until T cells are closer to 200 that you start to see some of the signature opportunistic infections that uh, characterize HIV, P, um, pneumocystis infections and Kaposi sarcoma. And then below uh, 200, uh, cryptococcal meningitis, uh, reactivation of toxoplasmosis, and a variety of uh, lymphomas begin to occur. And then at very low CD4 counts, pathogens that really don't have uh, any virulence uh, characteristics, don't make uh, immunocompetent people sick at all, like Mycobacterium avium or cytomegalovirus when it causes retinitis, PML, which is caused by JC virus. Those pathogens really don't uh, loom until T cells are less than 50. So this is just a list of uh, the AIDS-defining conditions. Some of them are, uh, have, uh, we have no therapy for some of them, and that includes uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy caused by JC virus, obviously the HIV syndromes of encephalopathy and wasting, and diarrheal pathogens like cryptospertia and microspertia. We don't have good treatments for those, and so initiating antiretroviral therapy is really the only way to control them. Also on the list are uh, other um, conditions that are not infections, they are caused by viruses. Kaposi sarcoma is caused by HHV8. Uh, invasive cervical cancer is caused by human papillomavirus, type 16 and 18 primarily. And a variety of lymphomas are highly associated with EBV, but all of these conditions, whether they're infections or tumors, are AIDS-defining conditions. So when thinking about an approach to OIs, uh, 
uh, we can divide it into those uh, pathogens for which we provide primary prophylaxis, those for which we provide secondary prophylaxis, and then something about vaccination and then treatment of OIs when they occur, and then the effect of antiretroviral therapy. Um, just to cover primary prophylaxis, um, we can divide. Uh, so there are some conditions that ought to be met uh, when, when you're deciding which pathogens to provide prophylaxis for. First of all, uh, they should be common and they should be severe. Uh, we don't want to provide prophylaxis for something that's trivial. And uh, the prophylaxis should be uh, effective and affordable uh, and without much toxicity. And that, uh, that is the case for uh, the infections here on the right-hand side. So, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side. So we provide primary prophylaxis for PCP, and uh, we provide we call it primary prophylaxis for tuberculosis and toxo. It's really prevention of infection rather than prevention of infection, uh, prevention of disease rather than prevention of infection. And for uh, disseminated MAC, we also provide primary prophylaxis. For PCP, when individuals have T cells less than 200, it's Bactrim therapy. For individuals who are lately infected with tuberculosis, we provide INH therapy. For toxo, again, it's Bactrim therapy that's effective in most cases in individuals who are IgG positive for toxoplasmosis. And for MAC, we provide treatment with azithromycin when T cells are less than 50. Some of the ones down here, uh, prophylaxis is really in the form of uh, vaccination. Uh, over on the right-hand side, there are infections that uh, some of the same ones that we provide primary prophylaxis for, we also provide secondary prophylaxis for. And then there are pathogens that are not common enough to, cause, to uh, cause us to use primary prophylaxis, but when they occur once, the likelihood that they're going to occur again is so high that we provide maintenance therapy or secondary prophylaxis. And that would be cytomegalovirus when it causes retinitis, cryptococcal disease when it causes meningitis, and so forth. So just taking uh, three uh, common pathogens, pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, we provide prophylaxis when T cells are less than 200 or when individuals have evidence of immune compromise uh, with the presence of oropharyngeal oral candida. And the uh, preferred therapy is trimethoprim sulfa, a double-strength tablet once a week, once a day, sorry. For toxoencephalitis, again, we're preventing disease, not infection. So for individuals who have T cells less than 100, and who are IgG positive for toxo. Again, Bactrim is the preferred therapy to prevent reactivation of disease. And for disseminated mycobacterium infection, that really doesn't occur until T cells are less than 50. And the macrolides, especially azithromycin, provides effective prevention for that. So we use a lot of Bactrim, but there are alternatives to the preferred uh, uh, regimen of a double strength uh, tablet once a day. Uh, Bactrim provided at a single, a single strength tablet once a day is also effective treatment or prevention for PCP, as is double strength tablets uh, three times a week. For people who can't tolerate Bactrim, Dapsone, 100 milligrams at once a day, provides good primary prophylaxis against PCP, but does not provide coverage for uh, CNS toxoplasmosis. So if you're using Dapsone to prevent uh, 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 PCP and the patient is IgG positive for uh, toxoplasmosis, then you need to add pyrimethamine and leucovorin weekly uh, to prevent that infection. Sure. Aerosolide pentamidine is also an alternative to Bactrim and Dapsone. It's not effect as effective as either one because of the way it distributes throughout the lung, but it is a, a reasonable uh, choice to, to bridge people who maybe are intolerant to all sulfa medications who are going to be starting antiretroviral therapy soon, and you can use pentamidine monthly until they no longer require PCP prophylaxis. Atovaquone is active against both toxo and uh, PCP, uh, but it's a little clumsy. It comes as a suspension, and uh, it's uh, pretty expensive as well, so it's uh, not frontline like some of the other therapies. Uh, this graph is just to point out that our, our guidelines for initiating prophylaxis against PCP are, are not perfect. This is data from the MAX cohort that looked at the development of PCP and stratified it by CD4% and absolute CD4 count. And you can see that most cases occurred in individuals with low absolute counts and low percentages. But maybe up to 20% of cases happened in individuals who had higher CD4 counts. So this was in the pre-heart era. So many of the, uh, probably the reason that people develop PCP up here is that their virus was not well controlled. And so they had immune dysregulation 
and uh, that was probably responsible for them developing PCP at relatively high CD4 counts. I think for people that are on heart with a suppressed virus, it would be very unlikely to develop PCP at these higher CD4 levels. So what has been the effect of heart on the incidence of OIs? Well, it's been good. It's declined for almost all opportunistic infections. The decline was actually happening before we had good heart, which became available in late 1995 and early 96. And this was likely due, at least for PCP and for MAC and for Toxo, because we had good prophylactic uh, remedies to prevent those infections. But then once antiretroviral therapy, good antiretroviral therapy became available, at the end of 1995, then the incidence of all opportunistic infections has continued to fall. So the last few slides is just to review uh, uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. It used to be the number one opportunistic infection that we saw in the pre-heart era. It's an atypical pneumonia that causes diffuse interstitial and eventually alveolar infiltrates like you're seeing on this film. Its clinical manifestations are subacute and subtle. They can start out with uh, low-grade fevers and dry cough and dyspnea, although in people with severe disease, they can present with an ARDS-like picture. Pathophysiology is that uh, it can be the result of either reactivation, and there are some studies suggesting that it's part of the resident uh, pulmonary flora, but there's also studies showing that uh, people inhale it and it's transmitted from one person to another. So it can be either reactivation or acquisition that leads to infection. And as on the previous slide, most patients have T cells that are less than 200. The diagnosis is obviously clinical and based on the characteristic chest X-ray findings that have interstitial infiltrates initially and sputum stains that uh, are positive for PCP, either histologic stains that pick it up with silver or uh, fluorescent antibody stains that uh, rival the sensitivity of the silver stains. Uh, patients are often hypoxic with uh, moderate to severe PCP. Mortality is uh, uh, significant in individuals who present late in disease, and it, uh, 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 patients can worsen after starting therapy just as the organisms die and their antigens are presented and there's an inflammatory response to them. So in individuals who present with moderate to severe disease with saturations less than 70%, we usually prescribe Bactrim as well as steroids to prevent them from developing respiratory failure and, uh, and, uh, and dying. Uh, this last slide is just to uh, tantalize you with some new uh, diagnostic tests that might be useful in some cases of patients presenting with PCP. Remember that pneumocystis is a, a, a fungus based on ribosomal RNA analysis, and so it contains the beta D glucan component of uh, the fungal cell wall, and that can be used to uh, make the diagnosis. This is data that was pulled from ACTG 5164, 282 patients with acute opportunistic infections, 70% of which had PCP. And this is a graph of the serum beta deglucan level in patients with PCP and without PCP. There's obviously a lot of uh, overlap here, but the, the uh, value uh, for uh, the median value of uh, beta D glucan in the serum of individuals with PCP was up over 400 compared to only a median value of 35 or 37 actually in individuals without PCP. So it's a fairly sensitive test. It lacks a little specificity, but if you pay attention to the level, then that probably dials up the specificity to some degree. Its positive predictive value is 85% and uh, with a pretty good negative predictive value of 80%. So in individuals uh, that might be in remote settings where it might, you might have difficulty getting induced sputum, this might be a uh, useful adjunctive test to make the diagnosis. So a um, brief summary, uh, OIs have historical significance. They ushered in the HIV epidemic, and they continue to cause morbidity and mortality, especially in people who are not engaged in care. Uh, HIV therapy, good therapy, has reduced the incidence of opportunistic infections. Our main preventative strategy is still with Bactrim that is good for preventing uh, PCP and toxo and salmonella and bacterial pneumonias uh, and azithromycin prophylaxis to prevent uh, disseminated mycobacterium avium. Remember that uh, pneumocystis is uh, uh, an indolent subacute hypoxic pneumonia. It's a classic OI associated with HIV, no longer the most common OI, but still causes significant disease in people not engaged in care. Best treatment is with Bactrim and steroids for people that have moderate to severe disease. And there are new diagnostics coming. Uh, beta D glucan is one we mentioned today. Uh, the test isn't perfect, but it can be useful in people in uh, uh, certain uh, circumstances. <laughs>